All right, turn in your Bibles this morning. Turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Titus. To the book of Titus. Now that's right after Timothy, which comes after Philippians and Colossians and so forth. So it's a small book. It's only three chapters. It's a small book, but it's got some powerful words. It's got some big words in it. And hopefully this morning we're going to be um, able to define some of these words. Because like anything, there's, there's things that go on in our life. Let me make sure this is on. But we do things in our lives where we take part in an activity, but once we truly understand the terms and understand how things work, we gain a greater appreciation for it. So I was thinking this morning, I was thinking about you, Jack, I was thinking about hunting, right? You can be a hunter, and you can just go out and get up in a tree stand and wait for a deer, and wait for a deer come by, and you can go back and you say, hey, I hunted. And that's true. You hunted. You were a hunter that day. But until you truly understand how the wind affects the scent, and how you understand if your gun is sighted in the right way, and you understand how you know that that deer's been coming down this way or this way, do you truly grasp? The depth of hunting and appreciate that more. Or I think of cooking, right? Like with my wife, and, and she loves to cook. I can go home and I can put a hot dog in the microwave and I can say I cooked myself dinner. <laughs> but or you can truly understand how cooking works and how the ingredients work and how adding more this and that will truly make something taste better and you truly understand it better. And I truly believe that with a core of my being, that that's the way salvation is. It takes a childlike faith to believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. I was saved without a deep knowledge of this scripture. I believed in my heart that Jesus, I confessed with my mouth that Jesus was Lord, and I believed in my heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, and Jesus Christ saved me. But then it was through going through and reading scripture and have, sitting in Bible studies and eventually going to seminary that I truly grasped a depth of scripture that I never knew before. Did that mean I was more saved? Absolutely not. But I grew and I understood salvation in a way that I never knew before. And this morning, as I promised last week, I'm going to go through scripture this morning and hopefully define some of these big words that we generally just gloss over. But these big words that we generally gloss over because we don't necessarily know what they mean or know the depth of what they mean, really secure our depth of understanding of salvation. Amen? So bear with me this morning. Some of what I'm going to be speaking this morning, you're going to say, Steve, I know this already. But I'm, I'm, I'm building to the end where we're going to answer some of these big words. So, join me this morning in Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. This is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a gentleman by the name of Titus. And he was doing many things. He was getting the house in order at a couple churches. He was teaching him how to set up elders and, 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 and the leadership in the church. But then in chapter 3, verse 3... Paul wrote this, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Verse 4, But when the goodness and the loving kindness of our God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. And not because of the works done by us in our righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration. There's a big word, regeneration. What does that mean? We're going to talk about that. And renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified, there's another big word. What does that justified mean? So that by justified by his grace, we may become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So I'm going to ask this morning, I'm going to give 10 verses this morning. And if you have a pen, I'm going to ask you just to jot these verses down. A majority of these verses are going to come from Titus. But I'm going to sneak some verses in from Romans 
And you may recognize the, Ro the verses from Romans. It's normally called the Romans Road, the Romans Road to Salvation. But these 10 verses, I'm convinced that when you go home, I'm going to ask you then to write out the verses. Just write down the, the, the scriptural references now. But go home today or this week and then actually write out the verses next to the scriptural references I get you. And you're going to have a very clear path for salvation. Not only for yourself to confirm who you are in Christ, but you're also going to now going to have a clear path to salvation that if you want to share salvation with somebody, you can go through these 10 verses of scripture and tell somebody where they were, where they are now, and where they will be. Amen? Amen. So I'm giving you a little homework. How cool is that, right? So let's start this morning with who we are and who we are not, okay? We were created and are created by God. We are not God. I wish someone would have told me that a long time ago when I was younger. You are not the center of the universe, Steve. You did not create all this. I know that's funny, but I truly believe that I was the center of the universe as a kid and growing up and just everything revolved around me. But when we understand that we were created by God, for God, for his good pleasure, and for his creative ability, and we are not him, is when I truly think we understand why we need him. And we see that in, in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's pretty much telling us that Jesus is God. And it's very important to know that Jesus is God, that he is divine, because we will see in a, in a second why that's so important. But even Colossians chapter 1 talks about um, Jesus Christ and his divinity, Jesus being God. And even in Colossians 1, it says that all things were created by Jesus, for him and through him. That tells us clearly that Jesus is God, the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. So the problem is that we are not perfect like God is. He's perfect, we're not, so what? Why we're susceptible to sin. We're susceptible to being corrupt. You say, I don't sin. John says in, in 1 John, you say you don't sin, you're a liar, and you're calling God a liar. All you have to do at night is lay your head down on the pillow at night and think of the thoughts you thought or, or what you did or what you even conspired to do. And you know that what you think is contrary to God. That's called sin. It's missing the mark. Sin means missing the mark. The bullseye is God. We miss the mark. That's sin. We all sin. Right. And we'll see in a second fall short of the glory of God. So the problem is we're not God. He is. He's perfect. And our hearts, without him, are in a place that's separated from him. So when we were born and we don't have a relationship with God, we are born separated from God. Amen. We don't have a relationship with him. And the requirement is that we have to have a relationship with him before we can spend eternity with him. So that's the problem. So when we hear Paul last week, Brother Mark, we preached on your verse, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For is the power of salvation for all who believe. We talk about the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news, Jess. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ came to save us. But in order to know the good news, we need to know what? The bad news. And the bad news is that we are born separated from God because of our sins. You're like, Steve, I get this. I, I truly know that y'all know, all know this, but we're building a case here. So the first verses I want you to look at this morning is Titus chapter 3, verse 3. And I just want you to write that down. Titus 3, verse 3. And then you can write it out later when you get home. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and in envy. And then you go to Romans 3. I want you to write Romans 3, verse 23. Romans 3, verse 23. It says, For we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory 
of God. We have all fallen short of the glory of God because we've sinned, and we were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and in envy. And then the next verse I want you to write down is Romans 6, 23. Romans 6, verse 23. So if we've all fallen short of the glory of God in sin, what's the penalty for that? The wages of sin is death. The result of our sin is death. The result of being separated from God and wallowing in our sins and not having a relationship with God is death. It's a physical death as came through Adam and Eve, but it's also a spiritual death. And that's not, very, that's not very fun to say around these parts anymore because people don't want to hear about the word hell. They don't want to hear about heaven. They just want to think that this life is all that there is. But then you watch Hollywood and you watch all that. They depict hell, but they won't admit it that it is true. But I'm here to say that there is a place for those who do not accept Christ. And it wasn't a place that he created for people. It was created for his demons and for demons and the devil. But he says, if you didn't want to spend time with me on this earth, why would you want to spend eternity with me? If you didn't make a choice for me on this earth, why in the world would you want to spend eternity with me? So therefore, you are relegated to a place that is apart from me, which is called hell. All right. So that's the problem. But then something happened. And I want you to write this verse down. This is the fourth verse. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. And it's just really the beginning of verse 5. Titus 3, verses 4 through 5. And the other verse I want you to write is Romans chapter 5, verse 8. You, see, you say, Steve, what happened? Well, this is what happened in chapter 3, verse 3. I mean, verse 4, it says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God and our Savior appeared. When the loving, when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, what did he do? Chloe, he saved us. God appeared and he saved us. Verse 5 says. And then you say, well, what does Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says? It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. So you're saying, Steve, what are you telling me? So we were born with a problem. There's bad news. We're born separated from God, but God provided the solution. That's what I'm telling us. Amen. He did. In his loving and goodness and his kindness and according to his mercy. Do you know what the word mercy means? It means not getting what we deserve. I played that game Mercy when I was a kid all the time. You know, you take somebody's arm, you, you put it in the back, and then you, you get them and you, you get them to where they yell, Mercy! Right? Mercy, stop! You know, who did that as a, as a growing up? Anybody? Okay, we've all done that. But it, it, it's, it's really truly not, you're, you're showing mercy to that person, but it's not what they deserved. Mercy in the sense of Scripture is not getting what we deserve. We deserve death, we deserve separation from God. But God says, I'm not going to give that to you. I'm going to give you something you don't deserve, which is mercy. And that's why he stepped in. God, in his goodness and his kindness and his mercy, he's perfect, he stepped in. So this is where it gets really, the big words start jumping in in a second. Because Christ died for us and he was raised from the grave. He not only died for us, but he rose from the grave. The power of God that lives inside of you now as a bro brother or sister in Christ is the same power of God that rose Je raised Jesus Christ from the grave. And there's a lot here. But why did it have to happen this way? Turn what, write this down. You don't have to turn your Bibles. Write this down. The book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. This possibly is one of my favorite passages of scriptures. I know I say that every week, and you're like, Steve, every prayer. But this is one of my favorites, and I've actually preached on this not too long ago. It says, verse 13, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
God made alive together with him. That's where God's stepping in. He says, you are, you are dead in your trespasses. You are dead in your sins, but God made you alive, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Now listen to this. Imagine this. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. And this, this legal debt, he set aside and he nailed it to the cross. Amen. And he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. He took the debt which was afforded to us, which was the penalty for our sin, which is death. And he took that debt, Colossians says, which was a, and all the legal requirements that came with it. I think last time I preached on this, Roy, I used you an example. I said, imagine somebody taking your house note and all the money that you owe on your house note. And when you've got that record of debt, when you sign on the house note, you, you agree to pay it. And if you don't, you go to jail and all that and, and all that kind of stuff where they come get your house. That's the legal demands that come with owning that home. And Jesus took that debt and he said, give that to me. And he nailed it to the cross. And he said, paid in full. Amen. There are no more consequences, which is death to your sins. I did it on the cross. The penalty, which was death. It'd be like us going in, let's say somebody in this, in this area murders somebody and they stand before the judge and the ju judge says you are guilty and await sentencing. And then that person comes back weeks later and says your sentence is death. What, ju what judge God did was he took us, we stand before him guilty for murder. Murder in our heart if we have anger against our brothers, right? We're guilty of murder, aren't we? Right. We're guilty of adultery. Even if you look at a woman with lust or a man in, in lust in your eyes, you're guilty. If we've lied, if we've cheated, if we've stolen, we are guilty before God. We stand before God and judge God says, boom, not guilty. Because 2,000 years ago, I sent my son to a cross. He hung on the cross, he took the debt of sin, and he nailed it to the cross, and no more problem with sin. No more consequence with sin. And he made us alive. He made us alive. But you say... Well, let me, let me go back to this. He could not overlook sin, Roy. Because sometimes we say, well, why, why wouldn't God just overlook sin? He created all this thing anyways. Why does he have to judge it? Because he is a just judge. The Bible says he is a righteous judge. We would, we would flip our lid if we were watching TV and judge Judy. Someone came before her and someone stole something and it was extremely blatant that this person was guilty. And Judge Judy says, eh, you're good. Go on your merry way. Just don't do it again. We'd be saying, Judge Judy, you are not a just judge. You are not fit to stand or sit as a judge, right? Wouldn't we? That's the same thing with God. If God does not judge sin, that which he says is abhorrent to him, that which is against him, if he were just to overlook it and let it go, he would not be a just judge. He would not be the rightful person on the throne. He would not be the perfect God we know him to be. So if we say to God, you can just overlook sin, then we don't understand who God is. He would not be a just judge. He must punish the crime of sin. We stand before, every single person that's born on this earth stands before him guilty. And the crime must be punished. There must be a sentence for it because it's, it's, it's against a perfect God. And Jesus Christ died on a cross 2,000 years ago to pay that debt for everyone who would believe. Everyone who would believe. His creation cannot solve the problem. 
We, as brothers and sisters in this world, cannot solve this problem. This problem is too big for us. In fact, Barbara, we are the problem. So how in the world are we going to solve this sin problem when we are the problem? We are the one participating in this. We are the ones who need to be saved. I can't save you, brother, Jack, and you can't save me. In fact, the Bible says here in Titus that our righteousness, our works, cannot save us. Verse 5, he says, he saved us not because of the works done by our righteousness. So God is God. We are not. We're separated him from him. Our destination is hell. And only God can fix the problem. And he did at the cross. The sixth verse I want you to write down is, um, you already did, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 through 14. And we talked about that. He paid it in full. So you say, and this is a logical question now. If Jesus paid the debt in full at the cross 2,000 years ago, is everybody saved? If Jesus paid that debt on the cross, it says he nailed it to the cross. There's no more problem with sin. The, the debt has been paid. Is everybody saved? The answer is no. Only those who what? Believe. Have faith. It requires faith. It requires it to, for people to believe that it is true. And believe that he was raised from the dead so we can be as well. Romans 10, 9. Write that one down. That's our next one. That's our seventh verse. Romans 10, 9. And actually, that's if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he raised from the dead, you will be saved. Let me ask you this morning. Do you believe that Jesus paid the penalty for your sin at the cross? Amen. Do you believe that he was raised from the grave so that you may have life? Amen. Will you confess that with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Believe in your heart that he has been raised from the grave. You know what Romans 10 verse 9 tells you? You're saved. You are His. Amen. He is your Lord. And everything that comes with that, He now expects obedience to Him. And you say, but Steve, is this, is this like just an easy peasy kind of deal? Like, so I, I confess this and now it's now it's my responsibility to, to make this happen. That's where this gets really juicy. Because really quick, I want to go through these three big words to tell you how secure your salvation is. You ready? Titus 3, chapter, chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. He uses the word regeneration. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration. You say, Steve, what does that regeneration word mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because regeneration means new birth. Right. It means new life. It means a spiritual rebirth. The Holy Spirit of God, Miss Mary, when you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in him that he was raised from the grave, this Holy Spirit of God grabbed a hold of you, quickened your spirit inside of you, made your spirit now alive to God, and you now have a new spiritual birth. You have been regenerated. I don't know how to express this more than I can express it, but there is a change inside of you that cannot become undone now. Amen. Your spirit is now alive to the truth of God. Amen. And that cannot be undone. It's a change. That's why when we say we're born again Christians, because we have been regenerated. It's a beautiful thing. It's not just, oh, I, I made a confession back when I was 12, and, and, and I don't know if God knows me. No, if you truly believe that, and everything that goes along with it, the Holy Spirit of God at age 12, at age 6, at age 82, grabs you and makes your spirit alive to him. And you are now regenerated. You are now born again. 
That's what regeneration means. You have a new relationship with God, the relationship you didn't have before. You were once an enemy of God. Now you're a friend of God. He calls you a friend of his. You were once opposed. Now you're in line with him. And now as a born-again child of God, you're not perfect. I say this every Sunday. I know you're not perfect. But God expects you to confess your sins, turn away from your sins, turn to him. And he is just and faithful to, to, to uh, forgive your sins and wash you of all unrighteousness. You will grow in him now that you are regenerated and you have a new spiritual life. That's the big first word. The second big word is justified. So being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hopes of eternal life. So these are the two verses I want you to write down for justified. Titus 3, verse 7. Titus 3, verse 7. And Romans 5, verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, this comes right on the heels of being saved. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so we're regenerated. We have new birth. We now know what that word means. What does justify mean? This is my favorite work in the Bible. Because I'm very works-oriented. I've told you that before. Sometimes I've got to be careful that my works-oriented lifestyle doesn't muddy up my relationship with God. Because sometimes I feel like I've got to please God with what I do. I'm just being honest with you. Because I love, I love concrete words. I love concrete action. And this word justified is a concrete word, Roy. It is a legal term. Paul loved the law. Paul, the Apostle Paul who wrote this book, was, knew the law better than everybody. So he used this word justified, which is a legal term, as an act of acquitting you from sin. That's a fancy way of saying you are not guilty. You are not guilty. So when it says you are justified by his grace, you are justified. That means he has said you are not guilty. It's a legal term. It is a legal term according to Paul. And remember in Colossians, it says the debt of the sin and all the legal components that went along with it was defeated at the cross 2,000 years ago. But for that to be true in your life and my life, we have to believe now. The work was done 2,000 years ago. Now it's upon us to have to believe in that. And when you do, you, are, you have a new life. And it's as if, and it is, not as if, it is that God has said, you are no longer guilty of your sin. Wow, that takes a weight off you, doesn't it? This is not just, oh, I confess to God and then I go away and I wonder if there's going to be any change in my life. The Bible says there's a huge change in your life. You're reborn and God has legally declared you not guilty forever. Right. When you believe, God declares you legally not guilty based on what happened at the cross 2,000 years ago. He applied it to your account. He took the money that you owed. And he took it out of his own bank account, which is Jesus Christ, applied it on your account, and said your account's paid full. You're done. You're legally restored to a state of righteousness with God. And you say, what's that word righteousness mean? Let me just give you a real quick righteousness. It's a condition that is acceptable to God. Amen. Righteousness is a condition that is acceptable to God. So when it talks about not our righteousness, but his righteousness, it's not our condition that brings us to saving faith in God. It's his righteousness, his perfectness, his condition acceptable to him. All your sins. Some people use that word justified, and they say it's justified, not sinned. That's how they remember it. Justified, not sinned. It's a cute way of thinking of it, and it actually helps you. But God still knows that you did sin. He can't forget your sins. We said that God forgets your sins. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He won't hold those sins accountable to you. It's as if he has forgotten those sins. And it's just if you have not sinned. I can't stress the legal side of this enough. He has legally declared us not guilty, Jack. Legally, according to his laws and his ways, God has legally declared us not guilty. Amen. This is a big deal. We have new life, and we're legally declared not guilty. 
And then the third word that's not in here, but they allude to it, is adoption. We are adopted into God's family. In verse 7, he says, So that being justified, declared not guilty by his grace, we become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Heirs, that's adopted. We have been adopted into his family. And with that, boy, we get all the rights and privileges that God has. And Jesus Christ has. We are now his. We talked about last week. The title of last week's sermon was, What is your name? And we said, your name now, if you believe in Christ, is you are a Christian. You identify with Christ. We are now Christians, and that is our name. Because why? Kind of, you've been adopted when you confess. You have a new life. You've been declared not guilty legally, and he has now adopted you. And when you adopt somebody, you sign on the legal line, you take that person forever, don't you? That's what God's done. He says, I will take you into my fold. I've got you forever. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. And I hope you're getting this now. And when you think of just these three words and you think this salvation really helps me make sure or may helps me understand that I am secure in him. Because Barbara, our salvation, no one can take it away, can they? When he gives you new life and he declares you legally not guilty, and he takes the step to adopt us into his family, he's not going to take that away. And he cannot take it away. And like I said last week, there is nothing that you will do that will surprise God in the future. Because Sidney, when he saved you, however long ago it was, that day he saved you, he knew exactly the sin that you were going to commit tomorrow. And he still saved you back then. He still knows the sin I'm going to do, let's say, on October 24, 2025. Whoa, fall off the stage here. 2025. He knows the sin I'm going to commit then. But he still saved me back in 1999. There's nothing that I'm going to do that's going to make God love me any less and say I wish I had not saved him. Amen? That's how secure your salvation is. And Brother Mark, I'm going to end. This is the 10th verse. And I love this verse. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 1. For there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Who gets tired of people doing this? Telling you what you're doing wrong. <laughs> Telling you how you're not acting right. You know who's really good at that? The devil. The devil's really good at getting in your mind and telling you, you ain't saved. A saved person wouldn't do that. A saved person wouldn't do this. What are you doing? And we've even got people around the, the neighborhood and around the world doing the same thing to us. And sometimes we can let that soak in and that can play with our mind. But what Paul is saying here is if you've been regenerated, you've been given a new life, you've been declared not guilty, and you're an adopted son, Roy... There is no condemnation. No one can condemn you. No one can take you out of Christ. You are his forever. You may not be who you want to be yet, but you are not the person you used to be. Christ has started something in you, Philippians chapter 1 says yet, and he will see it to completion. So I may stand before you not a perfect man, by all stretch of imagination. I am not who I want to be yet. But I am no longer lost. Amen? Amen? I am saved. And no one can condemn me. The devil can't condemn me. My neighbors down the street can't condemn me. My lovely bride can't condemn me. And I can't condemn her. No one can take that away from us. Right. Because we are in him. Brothers and sisters in Christ today, please, from the bottom of my heart, understand how big a deal this thing called salvation is. Because yes, the faith of a child with a little bee sting on her toe could say, I believe that Jesus is Lord. I confess that with my mouth. And I believe that he was raised from the dead. And even the confession of a small child will save you. But as we get older and we get wiser, we think, 
and the condemnation starts coming our way, and we start thinking about it more, we start thinking, surely this thing could come unraveled. Because of the sin that's still, the temptations that still come my way, and all this mess, there, there's something wrong with it. I'm con if you've confessed, and you are His, you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you, a deposit for eternity. Ephesians chapter 1 says the Holy Spirit of God now lives inside of you, Roy, as a deposit for eternal life. He will never take that Spirit of God out of you. Because it is Him. He is in yours. What's condemning you today? Is there something condemning you today? Is there somebody condemning you today? Or is it just the devil condemning you today? On the authority of Scripture... You have the confirmation that you are his if you believe with your mouth, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and he is raised from the grave. You are saved and you have the authority of scripture to say, forget that condemnation. You are his. Amen? You've been given a new life. I'm not the person that I'm going to be, but I'm sure not the person I was. Amen? God has started a work in me that he will see to completion. Do you believe this today? This is awesome, isn't it? These three big words that have multi-syllables that we often just run over in Scripture because we don't necessarily know what they are. Regeneration, justification, and adoption. Secure our faith. When we know that we've been given a new birth. We're now alive to Christ. We've been declared legally not guilty. And we've been adopted into his family. And there is no, no condemnation that can come our way to take that away from us. Brothers and sisters of Christ, go with that confirmation today. Those are not my words that's straight from Scripture. And I've heard enough amens over here from my brother Philip that he agrees with me too. And he's been in this word long enough. That what I just proclaimed to be true. And, right. and man, go. Share the gospel. Share this train of thought that I just went through with you. Share with people where they are. Where they could be. And where they will be in glory one day. If they confess Christ. Teach them that their sin was defeated 2,000 years ago on a cross, but now they activate it with faith today. And teach them, Connie, that they will no longer be condemned by anybody, including the devil, and their faith is secure. Amen. Brother Mark, this is the gospel that, Ma that Brother Paul, Apostle Paul, wanted to take to Rome. This is the one he wanted to take to Spain. This is the one he sacrificed his life for. Exactly what we just went through today. And that's, brother Mark, why he says, I am not ashamed of it. Amen. I'm willing to die for it because it's got eternal ramifications, not just earthly ramifications. Go and share the good news, the gospel. Don't be ashamed. Be bold because you carry his name, that which is Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for... All that you have given us. God, you've given us a word that can seem so complicated, but God, it's so simple and it's so true. Because all you ask us to do is to believe. There's no other work. There's no other thing. It's called belief. And Father, I trust that what I have proclaimed today is true and, and in accordance to your word. Father, I now ask that the Holy Spirit of God work on each individual in this place, saved or unsaved. And Father, bring them to a faith in Christ if they don't have that faith. God, if, if they do are of the faith but they have been condemned or have wondered if their salvation is real or if their salvation can become unraveled, Father, I hope today we all understand that you have done all the work. We have done nothing. God, it's in your hands we're in your hands, in nobody else's hands, and only you can bring us across the finish line. We love you, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name.